Uh, one of our panelists wasn't able to make it to the convention since he was designated moderator. I pulled a coup <laughs> with some support from the people, so uh, I'll be the moderator. I'll let the panelists introduce themselves for the opposite of the table. Okay, hi, Chris Mehegan. I've seen a bunch of you in different panels um, throughout the weekend. Um, I'm here locally. I am a member of the James River Writers, the member of Sisters in Crime. I um, primarily write novels, but I am in the process of publishing my first short story, and I've got another one, which I'm hopefully going to be landing very soon. So. My name is Warren McCain. I am the uh, editor and publisher of, fan, of, of the, no I'm not, of, <laughs> uh, of Wilder Publications and uh, sci oh, Jesus, I keep going, going way back, and uh, Fantastic Stories. I used to be the publisher of Science Fiction Chron Chronicle, Weird Tales, Fantastic Stories, Absolute Magnitude, Dreams of Death, Decadence, Mythic Delirium, Realms of Fantasy, and the official kiss of magazine for the rock band Kiss. <laughs> And Liz Gazette, Matthew Brady Quarterly. Well, the, the results of the whole cat <laughs> journal, which was the second largest cat magazine, but I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Warren has an extensive background in publishing. <laughs> and I've been nominated for a Hugo World Fantasy Award and a Chesley Award. My name's Lou Antonelli. I've been nominated two Hugos this year. Uh, I write primarily, sh I write short fiction. I've written, I've had published 92 stories in 12 years. So I've had three collections come up over the years. Texas and Other Planets came out in 2010. Uh, the Clock Struck None, which was alternate, and Secret History came out last year. Got good reviews. It's from Fantastic Books. Um, my nonfiction book, uh, Letters from Gardeners, is nominated for Best Related Category this year in the Hugo. It's a story of how I broke into writing short fiction. I had the last story that Gardner Dejois bought before he retired from Asimov. In other words, he bought my story and he retired. <laughs> That's been taken different ways by different people. <laughs> so, but, you know, I, I, and in my book here, I do chronicle the process of submitting and his rejections and his feedback and the rewrites. So this is, this is a topic I think I can address quasi-intelligently. Um, the topic is plotting and pacing a short story. Uh, Warren has seen more of this than anybody. So he might be a good person to lead off. What do you look for in, in the plot and the pacing of a short story? The first thing is got to grab you, and then it can't slow down too much, but it can't go straight to the end either. So you know that's where the pacing comes in. You want to not bog down, but still keep the reader engaged the whole way through until you get to the resolution. And one of the things I like to see is the character development tie in with the resolution. So when you have your plot, plot when you have your plot resolution, it's always nice if you also have your character resolution, which is usually the character at the beginning of the story has a problem that because of who they are, they cannot solve this story, this, this problem. They cannot fix it. They're incapable of it. They have to grow and become a different person. It's the stories that are easiest to sell is when that resolution, they become this person at just the moment they need to, to bring the plot to a final resolution. Kristen? Right. Yes. Yes. Uh, you said now you're working on a short story. Short oh fiction. no. Well, I yeah. I mean, yes. I have some completed and some in the process. But yes. So um, what 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 are you trying to do? Well, my genre is suspense, um, and I publish under mystery. So there's a certain formula that you follow with these. Um, with mystery, you've usually got a crime, and then you find out what is going. That's not new. You still want to develop that in a short story, but you really do have to keep it simple. You want to limit the number of characters so that you can spend the most time and get the biggest punch for each. Um, you want to still present all the clues that you're going to do, but you want to present perhaps more clues so that it's a little bit tricky for the reader to solve the mystery before you're ready to reveal it. Um, you want to hold tension so different things are happening at different times, but you don't necessarily want to confuse, correct me if I'm saying anything that you wouldn't agree with when you're reading these to choose. But, um, well, I don't read, no, we don't do much mystery, so I don't really care if people tip their hand on what's going on, but that, okay. yeah, but that, that is a genre yeah. thing. Right, so for me, it's mean, keeping it simple enough, yet maintaining the tension, which is a little bit of a balancing act. Board. But this, from my experience, that these are a good comments. So Warren's part about hooking the reader and keeping the tension. Yeah, you don't want to. Uh, how many people have heard the expression of Chekhov's gun? Yeah, you know, don't, in a short story, you don't have the luxury of introducing extraneous items. So, like Anton Chekhov mentioned that 
if in the first scene of a play there's a you know cross guns over the mantelpiece, there better be a reason. You know, those those need to be needed before the end of the story. Um, Mark Twain also says that if there's a gun on the wall in the first act, it must go off before the third. Yeah. Um, my wife likes to read, uh, read, watch TV. Plotting is plotting. You know, she'll watch Law and Order CSI, which involves detective work. Yeah. And I've taught her that if you know, in the point, in the exposition early on in the story, something is mentioned that doesn't seem to be related to anything else. Yeah. Why did they mention it? You know, if you mention the fact that someone, well, they went to college, but they didn't graduate, that is a point that you wouldn't mention unless it's pertinent later on. So, especially in a short story, you don't have the luxury of just a lot of red herrings and, and a lot of diversions. It's going to be kept ec economical, but uh, also don't surprise the reader at the end with a, what they used to call a Duke's Ex Machina. Yep. It just comes out of magic, you know, it does have the plot conclusion still has to flow. Um, a short story can have as much plotting as it neatly organized as anything. You know, the old saying, it's good if it has, a short story, it's good if it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. In that order, that helps. Although <laughs> 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 not always, you can sometimes put the middle up front as a flashback. Yeah. So oh, no, yeah. I, yeah, the story's, the story's still logical. I, I mean, I, I mentioned on the panel I was on yesterday, I had to do that because I knew the, the, the hook scene, the hook yeah. in my, this particular story, though, in terms of the chronology, is in the middle of the, the, the chronology. So it started off with a character having a flashback, and then we flashed forward to the start of the story. And what I lucked out, this is a story that is on the Hugo Ballot, too, my short fiction category uh, on a... On a spiritual plane is that it, it, it met up really neatly because we have a little flashback at the beginning to hook you, then the story begins, and then as it moves forward, you naturally float to the point where all of a sudden you catch up to the flashback, yeah. and then you keep going to the end of the story. I was kind of proud of that. When it uh, comes to plotting, the major reason that I reject stories is because one of the plot points is, then an otherwise intelligent person does something incredibly stupid. <laughs> and from there you're done, because so am I. I'm just, no. That happens all the time. You can't move the plot by having somebody be a moron when they're not a moron otherwise. They make one huge mistake, and the story goes on. No. I see it all the time. Well, yeah, the, the, the plot, the story has to flow naturally. You can't be, you know, playing God. Characters have to have motivation, and they can't make act out of the motivation. That's pretty important in, in detective stories because a lot of times you see this people might have multiple multiple people may have motivations to have committed the crime. Mm -hmm. You know, if you stop and think, and then you're over 40, you probably can think of a number of people who, who wish something bad happened to you sometime in your life. That's just that's you know I had an attorney friend who said he, was, he said if you made a district attorney or a sheriff or police chief happy and you're over 40. You can be arrested. You've broken a law sometime in your life. <laughs> you know, so the trick in the mystery is trying to find who actually is the one who did it. The who done it. That's what's called the who done it. Am I right? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And then suspense is the converse. Someone finds out that there is going to be a problem and they race to stop it before it happens. So that tends to be the genre that I tend to write also. So but you know, you can play with structure. You can have competing uh, point of views, have them, different people tell different parts of the story, still keeps the readers guessing as to what's going on and are they going to get there in time, that kind of thing. Now, you know, the stereotypical murder story, murder mysteries of whodunit, but you can have the how done it. Anybody ever see the movie uh, DOA? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, the guy's, you know, the guy's poisoned, he knows he's going to die, he's trying to find oh. out who done it, but it, the how done it was actually part of it too. Uh, you know, uh, that's actually happened in real life. Somebody being poisoned with a Russian, uh, yeah, the Russian dissident. He died. They didn't figure out he'd be poisoned with polonium because it's such an unusual way to kill somebody. You can have a how done it, where done it, you know, why done. It. Murder on the Orient Express, you know, had a good twist to it. You know, the who done it was uh, very extensive. Um, what's what throws you more? If you're reading a story, say from me or from Kristen, what will knock you uh, out of it? Other than the motivation making no sense. Oh, I get knocked out by lots and lots of stuff. Bad dialogue will knock me out. People are saying things that I don't believe people would ever say normally to somebody else. And if you ever say, as you know, because you need to explain it, you're out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> as you know, Bob. Slow start, starting in the wrong place. Yeah, all of those. And 
you know, you see it every day. But yeah, bad dialogue, stupid characters, setups that make no sense, problems that aren't problems. Mm -hmm. you know, we must solve this problem. It's like, why? <laughs> it's not a big problem. Stakes not high enough. Yeah, yeah, that can be an issue. Yep. Yeah. What stakes are too high for somebody who obviously is nobody? They can't save the universe. If what they are is a paper boy, you know, unless you're giving you some reason how they're suddenly.